Okay, well, thank you and uh, welcome, uh, Seal, for thank you, Blair, doing this uh, for us. Seal's yeah. going to do a presentation on the golden mean. Uh, she has, a, if you check out her website, she has amazing, realistic uh, mm -hmm. paintings of flowers, and you can see some behind her there. So uh, they are just amazing. The, I mean, the paintings are themselves are amazing, but the photos she takes and the color and the light that shines through the petals is uh, fabulous. So uh, uh, do check out Seal's website to see those. And with that, I'll turn it over to Seal and Excellent. With the presentation. Thank you, Blair. Um, all right. Well, first of all, welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to share this little dive into my, my quirky, nerdy brain that explores all these little things. And first of all, I'm from Penticton. So it kind of feels like a coming home. I live in White Rock, but I grew up in Penticton. So I'm really happy to be here sharing some knowledge with you. Um, if you don't know me, if this is your first kind of experience with me, I am a senior member with the signature, a senior signature member with the Federation in Vancouver here. And I'm also a member of the Oil Painters of America and our local South Surrey White Rock Art Society here. And I'm actually involved in doing the tour this year. So helping organize the, the tour for our local artists. Um, I have a visual arts degree from UBC, as well as um, a partial degree from the uh, Alberta College of Art and Design. Um, I was partway through my um, degree there when I received an apprenticeship for goldsmithing. So I'm a certified goldsmith and a certified life coach. So I've <laughs> education's been a big part of big part of my life. So when um, I resigned from my coaching uh, practice and decided to really focus on my art career, that was March 1st, 2019. So I'm only five years into really diving into how to paint all of this. And um, what a lot of people might, don't know that despite having a few years of art education, I really didn't learn how to do this. Um, this came from lots of practice, lots of YouTube videos, working with mentors, really practicing and diving into educating myself about color mixing and, and all kinds of um, the nuances. And in fact, when I was at art college, my third year drawing instructor, not first year, third year, um, said, so whose drawing is that? And I said, that's mine. And he said, well, sweetheart, this clearly isn't for you. And he waltzed me out of class. So <laughs> I'm here to tell him that actually, yeah, I can actually do this. <laughs> so after the, uh, over the past few years, I've really explored, I've had my nose in a book about art and design and color and all of those things. I think I've read 54 books up to this point on different methods and techniques. And I just, in fact, ordered a whole slew of Georgia O'Keeffe's books. Not that it's new to me, her work, but just diving into her influences and who she worked with and, you know, the, the photography that was coming up at the time of her, her art. So interested in, in looking at all of that. Um, what became very clear, aside from mastering the materials, is that the pre-planning for a painting became super important because even though you may be skilled at your medium, if you haven't put the planning into how you're gonna develop this image, it really doesn't matter how skilled you are because there's elements within that frame that need to be adjusted and, and you didn't see that when you started or you, know, you kind of got part way through and went, oh shoot. <laughs> so as artists, we have some very significant limitations that being that we're working on a two-dimensional surface, unlike a sculptor who can work with the full three dimension. In my case, I'm aiming for realism. So I don't have the three dimensions to create that. I have to use the tools at my disposal to give the impression of three dimension. Um, and that's where the opportunities as an artist get really exciting. Um, if we lean into the tools and skills that we have, particularly the NOTAM, which is the relationship between your darks and your lights within the frame, the color, how you frame your focal point, the leading lines that come in to draw the viewer into your particular focal point, what you wanna say with your art. Um, and then of course, all your values and hues, like the palette that you use to help really um, amplify what you're trying to say with your artwork. 
we have really a broad range of tools to draw from um, and becoming familiar with them is, is I think really fun and interesting. So I wanna make one thing clear at the outset. Yes, I'm an SF SFCA, yes, I have a degree, yes, all of these life experiences. I am no different than any one of you. And I just want to encourage you that I'm not here to tell you your way is wrong. <laughs> I just want to invite you to partner with me in my enthusiasm for this golden mean. And, you know, if there's something that you're curious about and you want to explore more, great. And if not, if this doesn't resonate, you know, continue composing your images the way you do. It, it's not about saying your way is wrong. I'm no expert. I'm just, you know, exploring and discovering on my own what, what this can do for my artwork. Um, so the bit of history into the golden ratio or the golden mean, it was first spoken about by a fellow uh, by the name of Euclid who lived in the time of Pythagoras. So we're talking about 300 BCE, so like, ages ago, the ancient Greeks. Uh, that's a really long time ago. <laughs> um, and you may have also heard of the Fibonacci sequence. Has anyone heard of that? It's a, a sequence of numbers, Kit has. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people have run into it. Um, the Fibonacci sequence was first talked about in India in 200 to 300 BC. Again, like, Old, old, old. Um, the Fibonacci sequence came to the Western world around 1200 AD um, with an Italian by the name of Leonardo Pisano Bonacci, who was later called Leonardo uh, Fibonacci. And the Fibonacci sequence, if you've ever been around floral arranging or, or anything like that, you've often heard that three and five are better numbers in a composition than say two and four that comes from the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence, I'll give you the, the numbers, zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight. And the way they work is you add the previous two numbers to get the next number. And it just goes on ad finitum. And what's interesting with the Fibonacci sequence is if you look at a tree with one trunk, if you um, apply the Fibonacci to it, you'll see that the trunk splits into two and then it splits into three and then it splits into five. So this Fibonacci relates to nature and the way nature opens up, whether that be in a flower or a pine cone or a tree or a sunflower, um, it, it refers to nature. So in 1500, about the 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci used the sequence in writing the Divina Proportione. So he used it extensively in his work um, as he was composing um, his different drawings and structures and kind of his industrial um, machines and that kind of thing. Um, the golden ratio in art, it creates a balanced relationship that the mind's eye really loves. So there's something inherent and unspoken when you use the golden ratio that people already identify, that feels natural, that feels normal, that feels expected. So I find that a really interesting um, piece or a, a technique that we can infuse our paintings with something that already draws the viewer in to feel like, I understand that. that that feels like something I would see in nature. And I want to encourage you too to expand your mind because I, I work in realism, but this also relates to abstract. When you think about the abstract structures, yes, it's not representational, but you can still play with the numbers of one, two, three, five, eight, where the colors repeated, repeated times, um, you know, used repeatedly through the drawing or the painting. Um, so keep that in mind. This isn't just for realism. It's for abstracts. It's for any genre that you're, you're working with. Now, what is the golden ratio? Now you've all heard, I'm sure you've all heard of the rule of thirds, which is dividing any canvas, either a horizontal rectangle or a vertical in thirds and where those lines meet that's where your ideal focal point is. 
the golden mean, golden ratio is a little bit different. It's 1.618. So I'll get into how to use it, but it creates a cross hatched grid a little bit narrower than the thirds. And you might think that doesn't really make that much difference, but I'm going to demonstrate what the difference looks like. So let me share my screen. Okay, there we are. Can you see that on the screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. Let me just get a few things organized here. Okay, so here's a little drawing. So what you see here is the original image. This is an image from my front garden. And you know, it's a pretty good image. It's got a couple flowers and some greenery, but there really isn't a clear defined focal point. And there's a lot of foliage that doesn't really add to the painting. It's kind of extraneous information that isn't giving the viewer any more information or adding to what I'm trying to say. Now, if I divide this by thirds, then that center of that rose petal or rose bloom lines up with that crosshatch there. And I've divided vertically and horizontally by thirds. So that, that works, that looks okay. But if you go to the golden ratio, you can see how much narrower these lines are and it creates a different grid on that same source photo. Now, the way you use the golden ratio is you measure your canvas, say it's 10 by 12, you multiply 10 by the 0.618, and you measure from one side of your canvas across to 6.18 inches of that 10 inch width. Then you measure from the other edge across and mark the 6.18 inches across that 10 inch. And you do that on the vertical as well. And that's how you get these cross hatch lines to know where your golden ratio lies. So that's just giving you a bit of an overview how that works. I wanna dive into some actual photos and sort through this idea or this the, the technique of using this um, so you can see how I actually implement it. So there's a couple ways you can use the golden ratio. One of them is to start from the canvas. So you have a 10 by 12 canvas, you want to put this particular image on it, let's figure out where the golden ratio is, and then you compose the image from there. Most times I use a source photo when I create my paintings. So here's a source photo that's, you know, not a bad photo, a little overcast. This is White Rock Pier. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the golden ratio to plan this painting from the photo stage and then figure out what size canvas I wanna use for it. So it's a little bit of a, a, a different route to get to the same um, result. So when I look at this particular image, the focal point for me, what I really want to draw attention to is this light spot, this little pocket in the clouds where there's a bit of sunshine coming through and the way all this kind of plays on the, um, the clouds, the shadows and the, the different lights. That's what I find interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick crop and these crop lines are going to give me thirds. They're not going to give me the golden ratio. So just bear with me as I, I draw this together and try to get that focal point onto those crossed areas. So I'll just, there we go. So that's, you know, it's okay. It's it's not really lighting me up. Yes, it, it lines up where the thirds are in this area, but I think we can do better. So let me revert back to the original. Uh, and 
And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna overlay something called uh, the golden ratio um, grid over top versus using the thirds. I'm gonna overlay the vertical, horizontal, vertical, there we are. So here's a little um, golden ratio overlay. And I'm just gonna stretch this out a little bit. down. So what I'm trying to do is get the this little cross hatched area over top of that window in the clouds so that I can see what's going on. And I've dropped down on the bottom. So let's bring this up a little bit. Okay, there we go. Right in there. Okay, now I'm going to do another crop to match that golden ratio size. A little bit hard to see at the bottom there. There we are. Okay. Now let's just hide that grid over top. And what's interesting here is now we have less of the pier, um, but the pier is creating this beautiful dark uh, leading line that comes right into the image. The land is bringing you back in the horizon. And then the clouds are leading you up into this pocket where the uh, focal point is. So for me, I would actually invest some time and explore this painting, maybe do a thumbnail sketch, do a no tan, see if there's enough information here to make that into a really interesting painting. It is a little bit low light. Um, so what I would tend to do is push that, the window where my focal point is and maybe brighten that up a little bit and drop the uh, drop all of this even a touch darker so that I'm really pushing the viewer into seeing uh, that little window there. So if there's any questions that come up as I'm going through this, just let me know because I'm happy to answer things um, as we go here. So let me... Oh. I have a question. Yeah. Do you, so you got your grid somewhere and it says that you're in Adobe Photoshop Elements. Yeah. Is that, is it part of that? No. So Adobe Photoshop, um, I think it's about $70 to buy it outright. So you don't have a subscription plan and then you have access to this beautiful photo editing program. So if anyone's interested in that, it is through Adobe and it's a one-time pay for it, you're done, you don't have a subscription plan. And the grid that I used, um, I'll make all of this available to you. It's a, a fellow who's a photographer and he's created all these overlays um, and you can pick and choose the overlays that you wanna use and you just place it in front of your photo and you can use the golden mean to design your painting. Um, it's super helpful to, um, to use that. Uh, let me just grab a ruler here, just hold on. Uh, I'm not sure where my ruler's gone. Okay, so here we have this supposed pretty interesting composition. Now what size canvas would retain these proportions? So this becomes really critical if you want to make sure that all of the information that's in this photo is also on your canvas versus doing an additional crop when you go to the canvas. So what you wanna do is you wanna measure your short side and your long side and you can do that right from your computer screen. I don't know, I don't have my ruler. So say it's, I'm just gonna guess, 63 millimeters wide by 98 millimeters long. What you do, is, sorry? CL, if you yes. go to the image uh, menu up at the top and you go down to resize, you'll be yep. able to read it off the screen. And I just click resize, resize uh, image, image size, image size. There you go. Okay. So yeah, 
nasty numbers, but you can do the math, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is great. So let's go into millimeters. All right. So we have 818 millimeters by 985 millimeters. So you take 818 eight, divided by 985 and you get 0.83. That's the ratio between those two sizes, uh, 0.83. And what I've done, and I don't have it handy, I'll, I'll make sure you get this as well. With conventional um, canvas sizes, I've calculated what the ratio is between the two sides ahead of time. So I can go to this, let's just do, uh, let's just for demonstration, let's see, 22 by 28. So a 22 by 28 canvas is 0.78. So it's a little bit small. So if we went to a 24 by a 28, we're now at 0.85. So that's pretty close to the 0.83. So if you had a 22, what did I say, 24 by 28, you could fit that image on that size of canvas without any trouble at all. So you're not having that issue of, I wanna paint this beautiful painting, but my canvas size is not the right size. You don't have to do that conversion. You can do it ahead of time so you know which size canvas to purchase. All right, so let's go. I have a few images here I thought I would pull up. Okay, so here's a hydrangea. Hydrangeas are really prolific down here. I don't know if they have you have them so much in the Kelowna area, but anyway, you see these a lot in the spring. This one's interesting because you've got some leaves that are kind of hanging over. The blossom isn't fully developed yet, and this lovely bit of sunshine coming on the edge. This leaf here is quite interesting compositionally, so there might be something there to kind of play around with. So I'm going to overlay the grid once again, and I'll share all these links to where I got these different things so that you can, if you wanna use it at home, you certainly can. Okay, there's my golden ratio. And I think what I'm gonna do, okay, so here's, when I look at this image, what I'm not so interested in, let me just hide this grid for a second. I'm not interested in this kind of grayed out foliage in the distance if I can help it. I want to take away that extraneous information. So I want to focus my painting on the left hand side of this image. So when I'm placing my grid, I want to see if I can eliminate that, <laughs> eliminate what I don't want to see. <laughs> I have this, I don't like painting dirt. <laughs> I try to eliminate the dirt. All right, now I need to come up a little bit narrower here. Okay, that looks really interesting right there. Okay, let's just leave that. And then I'm gonna do a crop. And hide the grid. There we are. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. I'm totally understanding everything you're doing up to okay. the point uh, when you, so when you pull the corners of the yes. grid, that keeps everything proportionally the same. It, you know, grows at the same rate. That's correct. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then I noticed that you're also sometimes taking the bottom and pulling it or the side, which kind of, to me, would throw the proportions off. But are you just kind of doing that from um, experience and eyeballing it or? No, the very cool thing with this overlay that you put over your image, yeah. it keeps correcting okay. to, to the golden ratio. So I was wondering, okay. When the, when the overlay comes in, it it's set up to be a vertical. You can also do a horizontal, right? but you you have to stretch it in order to get the dimensions based on the the, uh, the image. So it mm. recalculates and recalibrates so that it retains the golden ratio uh, proportions, which is super cool because you can mm. do a lot of playing around without committing to a painting um, when you're using the overlay over an image. 
Thank so you. this to me feels kind of exciting because this leaf tip is leading you in. This leaf tip is leading you in. Now, unfortunately, this one somewhat leads your eye into this grayed out area. Um, but if I want to focus on this beautiful highlight area, um, I think that the line here, the little bright spot on that leaf in the back is leading your eye down. So there's a few compositional things that are, I think that's kind of exciting. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested to explore this one and see if there's a painting there. Um, so these little studies I'm doing with the golden ratio and playing around on Photoshop is a way to Oh, kind of make some decisions about the painting without committing um, fully to it um, so that I can see what the painting might look like in the end. Um, then I can make the decisions about the canvas size and is it something that I want to commit to um, in the case of a series or, or exploring this idea a little bit further. So let me show you... Um, <laughs> I sort of hate to pull this one up, but I think it's worth talking about. This is one of my early paintings. And, you know, I was super excited about it. It's a beautiful image. I know now if I went into it, I would do things differently. But I wondered, you know, what's the, the golden ratio? What's happening here? That did I miss something in this composition and this image? So when I put the golden ratio over, I've missed it. I've missed the focal point. Um, the focal point for me is right here. It's this little, little pedal that does this backwards little flip. Um, that's where I want the viewer to land and then kind of look around the rest of the pedals, but I want that one pedal to draw them in. And when I dropped the golden mean over, I realized I'm not in the right place for that focal point to be in the ideal location to really draw the viewer in. So that's one of the things going on with it. The other thing going on is all of these lines, all these different stems and petals and that kind of thing are leading the viewer out of the image. There's nothing bringing the viewer back. All the lines are going out. And so that was something I didn't consider when I composed this painting and, and dove into painting it. So what I would do to correct it now, knowing what I know, oops, is I would move this probably here. Let me drag this up a little bit. See if I can get that focal point right in that crosshair and then bring this in, which of course adjusts that, that spot. And I think, I think that's all I would do with that. Okay, so let's have a look at that. I'll do a, a full crop on the image. Sometimes the drag lines go off the bottom of the image, so I have to move it to be able to grab this little, that little draw down again. Okay. There we go. So that's in relation to the golden mean this now, this focal point becomes more important. It becomes more of a, a center to draw the eye in. And in the paint itself, I would be changing these colors and making this stronger so that that really pops off um, and becomes a little bit more three-dimensional and draws you, draws you into it. The other interesting thing with this composition now is all of these strong stems and leaves that I've now cropped out of the left-hand side are no longer as distracting. You don't have this whole group of, of petals and stems sending you out of the painting. You've actually got a stem here bringing you in, a stem here bringing you in, you've got another line here bringing you in. So the elements of the painting 
that were already in place are much stronger when I cut the extraneous information from the left-hand side down so that I can really hone in on this focal point. Can you see how that made a difference? Yeah. Seal. Yeah. And when you're using the uh, the grid and you're you're putting your focal point always on the upper uh, right. Yeah. Quadrant is that is that always where you want your focal? So any you of those can points. choose you can choose any one of the four spots, and keep in mind this is just a guideline. If you feel like your focal point is better positioned below one of those cross marks, then do it. Right, it's got to feel right for you as the artist. I've I've just randomly chosen that upper corner, but you could put the focal point here. And then let's see if I can revert back to the image, um, the original. I don't think this one I can get um, a good crop with the amount of information that's here. Let me just see. Let's go vertical. So if I were to line up that there using the bottom. Uh, little crosshatch section. Okay, let's just Try that. I don't think that's as strong. I feel like the bottom of the, the bloom here is kind of essential information. And by cropping it like this, I've kind of lost that detail. So again, it's about playing around and seeing if I crop it here, or I crop it there, what, what actually happens? Um, what do I like better? Does it feel better having it this way or that way? And also with the, say with the landscape or something that has more, uh, or it has a horizon line, say. Yeah. Or, or trees with vertical lines. Would you try and line up those vertical or horizontal lines for sure with... yeah um in the case of landscape depending on your landscape let's see what else i have for landscape here i don't okay so here's here's another landscape i think using the elements that are within the landscape is super important because you can use them to your benefit um in really zoning in on what that focal point is for the viewer and those elements of your horizon line or the, the mast on the sailboat that's in the harbor or the tree or anything can be really helpful. So what I see going on in this image is there's a bit of an a Z um, shape. So you've got this beautiful line here of the shoreline, then the reflections on the water, and then this cut through the clouds. Do you see how that's, you've got those beautiful lines I don't know that this tree adds anything, so I may not really focus on including that in the landscape. Because for me, I think the focal point is this sense of light right in here. And I might be tempted to even take out this little bit of foliage here because it's, yes, they're trees and yes, they were in that environment, but they're not adding to the message that I'm trying to say with this particular painting. So if I were to crop this, um, actually, let me do the overlay because I think that will be, oh, let's just do this, okay. So what I would, I'm not sure I would keep that. Okay, so let's move this into a little bit. And let's take this down. And maybe this down just a little tiny bit. Uh, nope, I need to leave that up. Okay, so the way I'm making my decisions here is I want 
this crosshatch, now this is thirds, this isn't the golden ratio, but this thirds is gonna give me a good idea of how I'm trying to build this composition. So I'm gonna save that and then I'll put the overlay over top. and just see what happens when I get this in place. And it takes a minute just to stretch it out and get it to the right size here. Okay, so what I can see is it's a little low. My focal point's actually a little bit higher than this. So I have to take the underside up a little bit. And that, that might be it. Okay, let's do another image crop and get that a little bit shorter. Okay. But now your horizon line is right in the middle. Yeah, which is a weird compositional trick because you don't want it in the middle. And I wonder if it is exactly in the middle. It looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it might be. I was going to measure it, but I blocked the camera when I do that. <laughs> so what do you think? Do you think the horizon line in the middle is an issue in this particular composition? And this is an artistic decision. You get to decide. Um, and is the Z line that I was aiming for strong enough? Is it really leading the eye back and forth? Those are all questions we get to answer as an artist if, it's, if this is how we want it to be. So what's your feeling kit with the horizon line where it is? Um, I think I'd explore other other options and crocs yeah. before settling for it to be in the middle. But you know, I mean, it, it's not uh, it's not a bad uh, looking comp. The composition looks fine, but it does okay. kind of put it right in the middle. It does, yeah. So let's see if we can get that horizon line out of the middle. How's that? I think that's better. Yeah, it's just a little bit lower, lower than middle. Um, we could push that further, obviously. Um, but you well, see, when, when you when yeah. you crop the original one, you I think you had a bit more sky, so you might be able to do that. You could for sure expand that sky. Um, I can't do that easily without reverting right back to the. Let me see here. Well, that's okay. I think we get the idea. The, yeah. Okay. I do like that a bit better than, than the previous one where it was sort of smack dab in the middle. Sure. I think this was, yeah. works better. So this is the interesting thing with um, starting to play around with the golden ratio is, is you get to very quickly feel what's the change? What's the difference? What if I move it here or move it there? What if I stretch it out to more of a horizontal composition? Um, and I think that becomes interesting because investing our time in the further development of the composition through thumbnail sketches or even small maquette paintings, I think having this much knowledge ahead of time is helpful before you put in the time to develop it further um, is having that, that idea in mind. So I'm gonna pull in a couple of images here. Okay. With, with this painting here, I did something really interesting. Instead of using the grid for the golden ratio, I used the spiral. So the spiral is what we're used to in Da Vinci's work, um, in the Nautilus shell that has that, that beautiful spiral shape. Um, let me grab the spiral and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So the spiral is another um, golden mean tool that we can use when we're composing our images. And let's get this straightened away here. Okay. 
You can probably see it already before I even move the spiral over it. Uh. <laughs> You can see from this bud stage, the bud is at the core of this spiral, and then the shape of the blooms brings your eye right around. Well, that was super fun to play with and see how that spiral lays onto that compositional study of those flowers um, lining up together. So that was fun. And here's another one. So Seal, was that what the image looked like or did you move no. things? No, I don't, I don't ever, I shouldn't say that. I will eliminate things from an image, but I won't, for instance, add a bloom. Like I don't cut and paste elements from multiple photos to create one photo. These are all my own source photos from my own garden. And so this image was much bigger. I've learned that if I take a bigger image um, when I'm out in the garden, then that leaves me all the opportunities to compose and crop and do the studies to really refine to what do I really want to focus on. But if I don't have that extra information, I can't, I can't move around much. I've cropped myself into a corner too quickly, so I leave the image bigger. This one was quite a bit bigger before I started to kind of Pull it, pull it in, and and see what see what's happening. Yeah, and this is another one. Um, again, using the golden ratio and using the the lines of the the stems of the branches, the different buds to kind of really support this beautiful bloom, and then leaving the background in shadow. So when we talk about no tan, I don't know if anyone's familiar with no tan, but when you think about the ratio of your darks to your lights, if I reduce all of this to being a light color and all of that being a dark color, I am definitely not a 50-50 split. It's more of a 28 to 80, 88 you know, split or 78 split, whatever the math is. <laughs> So the no tan becomes important because having a 50-50 split becomes less interesting for your eye. So if you reduce all the lights um, or lift all the lights to white and all the darks to black, you can start to assess is the composition um, developing a painting that has a ratio of dark to light that's not 50-50. That becomes um, kind of an interesting thing to play with as well. Uh, but this painting, I used the golden ratio to figure it out where the positioning of the flower was. And uh, I think it's more successful than uh, what I did here with this one. But this is an earlier piece. So, um, you know, <laughs> we learn as we go. And that's the problem with um, our older work is we can look back and go, oh, if I'd only done this or changed that or painted that differently, it would be it would be a different story. So, yeah. There we are. Are so, these paintings in oil or acrylic? All in oil. They're all in oil. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So one thing that's happened with some of my work is I've done this beautiful composition and I've ended up with non-traditional canvas sizes, <laughs> which is interesting because I can't just run to Opus and buy the 22 by 28. Um, but with the, the use of the stretcher bars, I can often get very close to what I'm looking for by buying non-traditional lengths. So maybe an 18 by a 28 or a, a 20 by a 26, and that you can get the ratios that you need for a little different uh, structure of your, or a different ratio of your painting size. So keep that in mind, the pre-cut stretcher bars give you that opportunity to produce something closer to your cropped image. Um, without relying on the traditional canvas sizes. Yeah, I've even gone so far as cut my own stretcher frames in the garage. And <laughs> For those of us uh, who, who live in, in the Kelowna area, let me yeah. just put in a little bit of a plug for uh, Moldings and More, as you know, is one of our chapter sponsors, and they make beautiful custom sized canvases any size you like half inches mm -hmm. quarter inches doesn't matter anyway it's uh it, they have beautiful they make beautiful stuff okay and are they making frames as well like outer frames 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they're in uh, West West Kelowna, uh, okay. Seattle. If you're ever up this way, and uh, they do a terrific job. They're okay. not a retail organization; they're wholesale. But we have the chapter has a business license, and our members can purchase things directly from them. Under oh, that lovely! Law. That's great. That's great. That's a really nice plus because you can get beautifully constructed stretcher <laughs> stretcher bars in the sizes that you need to do interesting paintings. Yeah. I think it's quite wonderful when you hang in a gallery or you're in a show and your piece is an unusual size, right? You always, you're drawn to that one that's kind of the narrow landscape that draws you in or the, the steep vertical, you know, that's narrow and you're like, wow, look at that. And so I think we're taken aback a little bit by an unusual canvas size. So that's a little bit, you can stand out in the market a little bit by not having those traditional sizes. So. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting, interesting element that we can play around with. Yep. Now, are there any other questions? So you, I have one. It's yeah. Michelle. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> you uh, told us you're going to be able to share where we can get the grids. How are you going to share that with us? Is that going to come by email or how will you do that? Because well, if I could, if I could recommend maybe no. CL, you can email uh, anything you'd like to share to me, and then no. I'll disperse it to our perfect. members. Yeah, perfect. Great. So I'll include the grids. I'll include the link to Adobe if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Photoshop um, Elements for yourself. Um, I think those are the two main things that I drew from today. So anyway, if something else comes up, I'll, <laughs> I'll pop it in there as well. Did you want the history of, of the golden mean as well? No one's mm. typing, so that's okay. No, I think. Mm. Okay, good. Any other questions? I thought there was one more that came in there. I guess you explained yourself well. I guess so. <laughs> Just on the, uh, the, the um, positioning of the, like for this painting here, the tail yep. is at the bottom. Right. Is that important? Can it be anywhere? It can be anywhere. So with this grid, I can flip it, rotate it, turn it. So. If you had a different image, um, let me see. Okay, so here we are here. Let's put, oh, let's put this. Let's put the spiral. I, I haven't had as much luck with the spiral. I found the spiral to be a little bit confusing in some senses. Um, so let's flip this. Rotate, oh, uh, rotate it horizontal, there we go. And then, so I don't find this as easy to use. I find it a bit confusing. So if I put my focal point right in the <laughs> corner of the spiral there, you know what, as I say that, look at that bud, like that whole group of flowers, it fits in that spiral. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about that, but <laughs> the, the spiral has- You might been, have to play with that a bit. <laughs> yeah, the spiral has been tricky. I haven't always known how to, how to use that properly, but um, it certainly has all the same elements. I've seen people use it with portraits where they put the spiral on the portrait and the, the nose is here and the eyes are there and the mouth is there and it, it fits into that spiral. So I'm not as familiar with the spiral. Um, I have to say, and I thought I had, I'm not sure what I've done with it. I did have some other, there are some old masters where, oh, the other thing I'll include. So I finished my thought. There are some old masters works where they've applied the spiral so that you can see how the spiral's working in some of their compositions. Um, and I, I'll include a link to that. And there's also, does anyone know Ansel Adams work? Now, Ansel Adams was a photographer, I believe at the beginning of the 19th century, 
And he was um, photographing Yosemite almost exclusively. He fell in love with the place and would go time and time again and capture beautiful scenery with the mountains and the sunsets and um, El Capitan and all these beautiful icons in Yosemite. Someone took his photos and applied the golden ratio to his images. Now, mm. was he thinking about that when he was taking the images? I have no idea. But when you apply the golden ratio, his images are dead on. Like the peak of his mountains with the flow of the river is exactly proportionately correct for the golden ratio. So it's quite remarkable. I'll include that link as wow. well so people can take a look. It's very interesting and there's, I think 15 of his images, some of some portraits and some landscapes that they've used the ratio to kind of decipher how, how his paintings were oriented. He was iconic. He, he became very, very popular um, from the stunning, stunning landscape uh, photos that he took. So yeah, in my research, I found that and thought, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> following in Ansel Adams uh, <laughs> footprints yeah yeah cool. so I hope that's a help I hope um you know it it piques your um interest into what the golden ratio could do when you're composing the compositions that you're working on and it could apply to anything it could be a you know whether you're abstract or landscape or floral or still life all of these same um systems apply so I hope that's a help and that uh, you're interested to explore what that's all about. Wow. Yeah, it is. I've, I've usually just done the third, so I'll definitely right. try. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with thirds. Thirds is not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, if you want to rely on the orientation of nature, the, the spiral of a sunflower has a particular ratio of how those little, um, sunflower seeds are oriented and the circular pattern it all relates back to the golden ratio so thirds is not wrong it's just the golden ratio relates more inherently to the natural rhythms of of nature yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, even the spiral very of like a hurricane when you see yeah. like a hurricane over florida or something it's that spiral it's the same ratio so yeah very cool wow <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to uh, to playing around with that. Uh, yeah. When you send those files, mm -hmm. I've been using an armature called the harmonic armature, which is again slightly different than the rule of yeah. thirds, uh, and I've enjoyed composing with that. So I'd be really interested to see how this one works. How they relate? The overlay. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and we all have different experience and different sensibilities, and I think. You know, what's inherently clear to me is that each one of us has an artistic vision that's really valuable. So the way you see the world is like, we need more of the way that you see things because it's different than the way we see things, right? So mm -hmm. I just, I love artists and I love that everyone creates different art in different ways and different mediums and different subjects. And it's all just such a beautiful addition to our world of, you know, creating beauty and light and showing people something that they may not see otherwise. So, mm. yeah. Good. Great. Very yeah. inspirational. Good. That was the goal. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very great. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're yes. so very welcome. My pleasure. My thank pleasure. you. And I will include my email. If anyone has questions, if you start dabbling with this and go, oh my God, now what did she say? I can't remember. <laughs> Just okay. message me and I'll, I'm happy to help you with it. So thank Great. you. Yeah, no problem. I think we end at eight. Do we not? Yeah, we're, okay. we're good whenever if you're okay. good to go. We're good to yeah. go. Uh, did you <laughs> say, <laughs> sorry, did you say that you um, were going to um, show us where we could find those overlays or? Yes, I will send them to Kit and Kit okay. will forward them to you so that you have those. And like I say, I'll include my email when I send that message to Kit so that if you want to contact me directly, if you've got a question, by all means. Okay, yeah. thank you. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. It's very, very good. No, oh, you're so welcome. My <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> good. Thank okay, you all well, for coming. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Seals. That was wonderful. Good. And yeah, thanks everybody for uh, zooming in tonight and uh, 
enjoying this inspirational hour or two. Yeah. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Good night. Okay. Good Thank night. You, everybody. Thank you. Good Bye. night.